Time on Cars is sponsored by Car Vertical. With just a registration number, or even better, a VIN, Car Vertical will search over 20 European databases to find out whether any car you're looking at has a hidden past. They can see if a vehicle was used as a taxi, stolen, suffered fire damage, or involved in a crash, even when it wasn't written off, so could pass other checks. Car Vertical is now an essential tool in my car buying kit, putting all the information I need to know together in one easy to read report. Even better, if you follow the link in the description down below, you'll get 10% off. A big thank you to them for being today's sponsor. Hello everybody. Here in Britain, I think it's pretty fair to say that we rather look down upon cars produced by our friends over in the United States of America. However, the truth is that so very few of them ever made it to these shores that not many people really got the chance to find out whether their prejudices were actually justified. To be honest, most American market cars just wouldn't make sense here. They're not particularly nice inside, but by the time you've shipped them over, they would be quite expensive. They are, yes, very powerful powerful for the money, but also very thirsty, and fuel prices here historically have always been a lot higher than they have in the States. To give you some reference, if you are watching from America, currently it's £1.33 a litre for regular unleaded fuel. That's equivalent to your 91 octane. In other words, California prices, and sometimes then a little bit more. Our roads are often quite a bit narrower than those in the States, particularly in the cities, and then even in the countryside, they're not particularly broad can be very twisty and aren't really the sort of thing that Americans really cared about that much. These days I don't really look down upon the sort of straight line drag racing culture like I used to and in actual fact I have become to enjoy some American cars with a few real surprises, particularly the fairly recent Chevrolet Camaro I was absolutely blown away by and had they made it in right hand drive I think it would have been a real competitor for the BMW M3. My first experience of a proper American car in the States was actually a Chevrolet Corvette, a C7 at the time, a fairly new thing. And I've got to say, in one fell swoop, it absolutely demolished all of my preconceptions about American cars. It was actually not too bad on the inside. It went very well, it even handled, and it looked fantastic. But today I'm driving the car which actually I think began my hatred of all things American, a C4 generation Corvette. And I suspect it's one of Jeremy Clarkson's late 90s VHS tapes in which he hunted one of these down with a helicopter that's probably the exact point where my disdain for these things began. I think really it's the looks of these which I never gelled with and are probably the main reason I never liked them. This exact car is one of the last of line, being a 1996. However, the model was introduced in 1984, so by the time I became aware of them, they were in actual fact genuinely quite out of date. The C5 which replaced them did look a little bit more modern, but these days I think is just the sort of in the middle nah, Corvette, it doesn't really do much at all. Conversely, there are a lot of people I know who really don't like the later C7, and I myself am still very much on the fence as to how I feel about the C8. I don't dislike it as a car, but I'm not convinced it's a real Corvette. This one is in what some people might describe as American Nightmare specification because it's a white convertible. White's not a colour I generally like on cars and I don't think this wears it especially well. The convertible also means it's even that little bit more ugly than the regular coupe and, bizarrely, it also means this has essentially no boot. I mean, seriously, the there's, there's not a boot at the back. One of the good things about the C4 over the old C3 generation Corvette is that it was the first to introduce on a production car a big glass hatch and an easily accessible rear storage space. They're actually quite practical as sports cars go. However, for the convertible, no luck. Even with the roof up, you don't really get a lot of stowage and roof down. I've got my backpack in there and it's full. Frog Eye Sprite owners, I think, will be able to relate. The wheels on this car are also somewhat challenging. They are what they call the saw blade design. I will say though, I do like the fact they are directional. It always bugs me when manufacturers, especially Porsche, build wheels that look a little bit like that, but then they turn different directions on each side of the car. So one side looks like it's permanently reversing. Chevrolet at least 
fix that. The C4 was actually quite an important model for Chevrolet in general because it was a complete clean break with the C3 that came before. That also had a very, very long production run and I've driven a late example of one of those and you could really feel that was a car that desperately needed replacing. So the big changes here included the fact that it's no longer an all fiberglass body, in fact has now a lot of plastic panels that are quite wobbly as is the rest of the car in fact scuttle shake in this is absolutely horrendous they also ditched the coil springs at the front and introduced a transverse leaf spring now, that's another thing that many of us europeans have mocked the americans for still using cart springs in their cars well the way they use it here is very clever so much so that even lotus thought it was actually a very good idea and you've even got on the more modern cars carbon fiber leaf springs too they actually use it as a sort of combined spring and anti-roll bar this still classifies as an all independent suspension it's actually got wishbones at the corners as well it was in fact a pretty good handling car of the day and on the skid pan could outperform the equivalent Porsche 928 so it's no slouch One of the other many reasons people tended to mock American cars is because they seem to eke such a pitiful amount of horsepower out of such large engines. The old C3 was a very good example of this. By the time production finished, they were getting only about 190 horsepower out of a near 6-litre engine. This was a dramatic improvement. They started with only 250 horsepower from their 5.7 litres, but by the time this particular car came around, they were getting a more respectable 300. You've got to remember that Porsche were getting around about the same from the 5 litres in the 928, so it's not anywhere near as bad as it sounds. If you got one of these with a manual in 1996, rather than the LT1 engine that this has, you'd get the LT4, and that had 330 horsepower, all of a sudden an actually decent power figure. Of course, being an American car, torque was a little bit more important, and this has about 340 pound-feet. That's about 460 newton meters from memory. Unfortunately, this is also connected to one of those American staples, an automatic gearbox. Perhaps the most unusual transmission option for the C4 was the Doug Nash 4 Plus 3, which is a four-speed manual with automatic overdrive enabled in three of the gears. It was Corvette's way of trying to give people a manual with the performance and the reliability, but also a little bit better economy. I think these days it's looked upon more as a bit of an odd curio rather than an actually decent gearbox. Later on, you could even get a six-speed manual, and one of the highlights of the Corvette C4 must be the ZR1. The ZR1 was the hot version of the C4, and that badging has been used on many Corvettes since. It got one of the most unusual engines ever to grace a Corvette, a 32-valve overhead quad cam V8 based on the existing Chevy Lump, which actually has the cam in block. That's one of the reasons, by the way, the Chevy small block is so popular for kit car builders and engine swaps. It's a tiny, tiny thing. This particular car has a really interesting history. It was actually bought originally by General Motors themselves and shipped over to one of their testing facilities in Michigan. It spent two years with them and then 22 years with its next owner. After that, it was exported and arrived in Britain in about 2015. Andy picked it up a month ago when he was looking for something a little bit different to complement his Ford Fiesta ST that's also been on the channel. And I've got to say, you don't really get much more different to a Fiesta ST than this. There are actually quite a few things that I like about it. I mean, this particular car has been really, really well cared for. And there are a lot of quirks. I mean, Doug DeMuro could have a field day with one of these, and probably would if it weren't for the fact that in America, the C4 is still a fairly commonplace car. Some of my favorite things include the really bizarre seat belts. I like the little aerodynamic caps on the wing mirrors, although they may be aftermarket. This door handle looks like it's been built out of a kit. The dash here is quite nice too, plenty of gauges. I maybe have a little bit more nostalgia for the early all digital, but it's okay. And the seats actually are really good. The engine's also very tractable from low down and for just cruising around, which let's be honest, is what this car's for, it's very, very good. Questionable looks and scuttle shake aside, the only real fault I've found with this car so far is the fact that between first and second, it's a little bit clunky, but that's almost certainly going to be resolved by just refreshing the transmission fluid. This generation of Corvette was apparently much more sporting than that which came before, so let's find out if it's actually 
any better on the roads or not. So we shall pop her out of overdrive into just drive and see what happens when you put your foot down. she's actually got a bit more get up and go than I really expected her to. I'm actually quite enjoying this car. There is a pace at which it is happy, which conveniently is just below the speed limit on this kind of road. In America, this would almost certainly be a 35. But here, this is a 60 limit. And between 50 and 55, this car's really very happy. Get between 55 and 60 and you do feel like she's starting to work very hard. Body control is actually quite impressive. She corners very flat indeed. The steering's quite quick too. And the balance between ride comfort and handling is better judged than I really probably expected. Steering feel is not excellent and the gearbox is a difficult little so-and-so. I tried to force it into second earlier and it just wasn't very happy with me. That being said, when you're driving a left-hand drive car with a manual, it's not the most natural thing to just hop into, so I'm actually probably enjoying it more with the auto than I might be with a manual for just a, a quick blast. Pace is also honestly adequate. The car's got enough go in it for you to be able to enjoy a road and not really feel like you're being held back. Soundtrack is decent too, although the long gears and auto box mean that it never really screams or shouts or barks. It's just a sort of constant burble. I don't really mind that too much, although it doesn't sound like some of the sportier Corvettes I've driven. I'm even out here recording my drive-bys of the car and it actually sounds really really nice judged just right not too loud not too quiet <laughs> i'm never going to buy one i promise i'm never going to buy one but i do see the appeal in america i know they're really really common cars but here they're just that little bit more unusual that does mean that trying to get stuff done is obviously a bit more difficult than it would be if you had one in the states you know everything you want has to be shipped over and that makes it all quite expensive but overall i mean look at that it's just it's just something about it, isn't there? View out is pretty good. You can see lots of that bonnet, which means you can place the car with relative ease. That's useful when you're on the wrong side of it. And it's also sized quite well for this road too. On the tail of the Dragon, this might not actually feel entirely out of place. Today's road conditions are a little bit mixed with patches of both wet and dry, so I'm taking things just that little bit easier than I might normally. But I'm not really feeling like the car's holding me back all that much. This reminds me in a lot of ways of the earlier Jaguar XK, you know, the X100 generation car, and some of the Maseratis that I've driven too. There's just a little moment while the car sort of settles itself and gets the suspension loaded up and then it all sort of starts to work. There's just a very, there's a very short delay between your steering input and something actually happening, but you get into it very quickly and it's quite predictable. There's quite a bit of wind in here as well, but it's not actually that noisy. You see, the truth is, with a car like this, what I think of it doesn't ultimately really matter that much because something of this nature is very personal and, you know, it's bought because its owner really wants one and wants something different. All I actually ever really care about is whether I'm enjoying driving it or not. And I've got to say, I am. I, I really am. It's very pleasant. I did not expect that. Brakes are not too heavily servoed, they do seem to work, bring the car to a stop nicely. Seats are really good actually, lots of adjustment through this natty little panel here, so you've got the same set of controls for both left and right side of the car. If it wasn't for the fact that storage is pretty much criminal, I would have said that um, this would be a great car to take up to Scotland. Now, this town has just shown the weakness in this car. When you're on the move and when the roads aren't too challenging, it, it does a fairly decent job, but around town, it's not very well set up. It crashes and bounces over this road like nothing I've ever known. In fact, I didn't realise this street was bumpy until today. Yes, I could easily see how you could get in a car like this, drive it 30 yards and go, yeah, 
it's just as rubbish as my mother warned me an American car would be. Look at this. Bounce, 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 bounce. That... <laughs> It's a pogo stick. That, yeah, that is where it comes apart. That's not very good. And I'm surprised because actually, American roads, we sort of picture them as being very nice and smooth and straight. They are, in very many cases, quite straight, but they're very rarely that well paved. In fact, a lot of them I've been on are very, very poor. So to have a car that rides this badly at low speeds, I'm kind of shocked. Getting in is not too bad, although when you first look at it, there is not a lot of space in this car at all. Because they built this in a very different way to the previous generations, they needed to get as big a side cell as they could in order to get some rigidity into the chassis. And that means that you've got to clamber over it before you drop down into it. But once you're in, there's actually plenty of room in all honesty. And let's not forget, pop-up headlights. And who doesn't love pop-up headlights? In fact, these don't really pop up, they sort of twirl round. Very showy, very flash. I would very much like to try a sportier version of one of these, a coupe. Well, the coupe, it's a Targa, that's what it is. Interestingly, in those, the Targa top actually does bolt in rather than just clip in, so it becomes something of a structural member of the car. But I'd love to try one of those with a manual and see if it's actually any better dynamically than this. Might be, might not. And while this will still be a car that I find revoltingly ugly to look at, in this specification particularly, it's a, a little bit Floridian granddad, but I can respect it for that, and I can now happily say I enjoy the C4 Corvette. Not something I thought I would say. Genuinely, hand on heart. So a big thank you to Andy for popping out with his lovely car. And it is really lovely. I mean, the condition of this thing is incredible. It has been clearly very, very well kept by its previous owners. And I hope he gets quite a bit of enjoyment out of it. But for now, that's all from me. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.